Hey guys and welcome to Heart of Gastro. In today's video, we will be talking about peptic ulcers. So let's get started. So what are peptic ulcers? The word peptic comes from the word pepsin, which is an enzyme in the stomach that is involved in the process of breaking down proteins. And ulcers are open sores that develop on the inside lining of the stomach, which is called the mucosa layer or the upper portion of the small intestine. And that is called the duodenum. So on the picture on the right, you can see these ulcers, which are these open sores that have developed in this cavity, which is the stomach. And this is actually the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And as you can see, there's some sort of opening here, an erosion, and that is an ulcer of the duodenum. And here is an ulcer of the stomach. And just to the right of this, you can see this little bubble, which shows you the layers of the stomach and this is a cross-sectional layer of this little part here and you can see that the ulcer is a sore that develops in the mucosal layer which is the first part and if the ulcer is a bit more aggressive or erosive it's going to penetrate through to the submucosal layer which is the second layer of the stomach so most of the times when we have these ulcers they develop in the mucosal layer which is the first lining or the innermost lining of the stomach so what are the types of peptic ulcers? So as we mentioned in the slide before, there are two specific types of peptic ulcers and they are the gastric ulcers, which are ulcers that form in the lining of the stomach. And we also have duodenal ulcers, which form in the first part of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum. So here's that picture again with the duodenal ulcer and here's the picture with the stomach ulcer. So what are the causes of peptic ulcers? The number one cause of peptic ulcers is due to a helicobacter pylori or an H. pylori infection. And H. pylori is a bacteria that causes an infection and inflammation of the stomach and the duodenal mucosa. Another cause is the frequent use of NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin, ibuprofen or other anti-inflammatory drugs. Smoking excessively can also be a cause, being a chronic alcoholic being exposed to radiation therapy, having chronic untreated stress, and eating spicy foods over long periods. So now let's talk about some symptoms of peptic ulcers. The patient may experience a burning stomach pain, feeling of fullness, bloating or belching, having fatty food intolerance, experiencing heartburn, having vomiting, which can occur with or without blood, and if they vomit with blood, it's called hematemesis. Having nausea, having bloody or dark stools, which is called melena, and having unexplained weight loss. So how are peptic ulcers diagnosed? An upper GI endoscopy, which is a flexible tube to look inside the upper GI tract, can be performed. The endoscopy can show us any ulcer that may be in the stomach or the duodenum. So, in the picture here we have, you can see that scope has gone down into that first part of the small intestine and that is in the duodenum now. And this is what the endoscopic view, you can see that sore that is developed in the mucosal layer of the duodenum. And to the right, you can see our scope is now in the stomach or the gastric cavity. And here we have that sore that is developed in the mucosal layer of the stomach. So this is what the endoscopic views look like of the gastric and duodenal ulcers. Another test that can be used to diagnose the gastric or the duodenal ulcers is the barium swallow test. And in the barium swallow test, the patient ingests a solution of barium sulfate. And this barium sulfate is a metallic compound that shows up on x-rays and is used to help see abnormalities in the GI tract. After the patient ingests the solution, X-ray images are taken to track its path throughout the digestive system. So you can see here on the left, we have the radiographer, which is ready to take those X-ray images. And we have the patient ingesting this barium solution. And this is what the barium sulfate X-ray looks like. So any areas in which we have this consolidation or this collection of uh, barium within the stomach or the small intestine, these localized collections of barium, that means there is an ulcer in that area. So you can see that very opaque area within the stomach cavity and those circular areas are the ulcers. 
So how are peptic ulcers treated? So as we mentioned earlier, the main cause of peptic ulcers were due to an H. pylori infection. So if the patient does test positive for an H. pylori infection, we will have to prescribe the proper treatment to eradicate the H. pylori first, and that is how we will treat the ulcer. So let's talk a little more about the treatment of H. pylori. So for the treatment of H. pylori, we could use the triple therapy methods, which are usually prescribed for 10 to 14 days. And there are three treatment regimens which we can choose from. The first one is omeprazole, amoxicillin, and clarithromycin, which is given for 10 days. Bismuth subsalicylate, metronidazole, and tetracycline, which is given for 14 days. Or lansaprazole, amoxicillin, and clarithromycin, which has been approved for either 10 days or 14 days of treatment. So continuing with the treatment options for the peptic ulcer disease, uh, in patients that do not have an H. pylori infection, who are H. pylori negative, we can prescribe over-the-counter antacids, PPIs, or H2 receptor blockers. So let's talk a little bit more about that. The antacids. The antacids neutralize the stomach acid, and examples of these drugs are Malox, Melanta, Gelucel, Gaviscon, and Rolates. The proton pump inhibitors are medications that block acid production and heal the ulcers. And some examples are esomeprazole, lanceprazole, omeprazole, pantaprazole, rabeprazole, and dexlanceprazole. The H2 receptor blockers are medications that reduce the acid production. And these medications include cimetidine, formetidine, nizatidine, and ranitidine. And something to note about the proton pump inhibitors and the H2 receptor blockers are that the proton pump inhibitors, so the examples I mentioned earlier, are actually stronger blockers of acid production than the H2 blockers. So these drugs here, um, again, esomeprazole, lanceprazole, omeprazole, etc., are stronger blockers of that acid production. So they are more useful, let's say, in the treatment of peptic ulcers. So what are the complications of peptic ulcers? So patients who suffer from peptic ulcer disease may have bleeding of their ulcers, perforation of their ulcers, penetration of their ulcers, malignancy, or a cause of gastric outlet obstruction. So this is a benign gastric ulcer, and if that is long-standing, it can actually turn into a malignant gastric ulcer. Uh, down below, we have the bleeding, an ulcer which has bled out, and here we have penetration. So you can see that this ulcer is not only in the mucosal and submucosal layer, but it's actually penetrated deeper down into deeper layers uh, of the stomach. So that is a big problem. And of course, the patient is going to experience lots of pain, lots of discomfort, because that stomach environment is very acidic and it's getting into all these layers that it's not supposed to get into. Um, if the ulcer is closer to the duodenum, in this area, which is called the pylorus, it may actually cause a gastric outlet obstruction, so the food won't be able to pass that easily down into the duodenum from the stomach. So these are all the complications of peptic ulcers. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure you hit that subscribe button, like, comment, and share. And if you would like to download a copy of this presentation, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care. Bye for now.